Welcome to Speaking of Crypto with your host, Shannon Grinnell. Today, I talked to Dr. Jane Thomason. She's the author of Blockchain Technology for Global Social Change. And we talk about her thoughts on the importance of being able to put digital identity on a blockchain, how remittances using blockchain technology can aid in financial inclusion, and why being able to hold Bitcoin in emerging economies can be empowering. This is episode number 90 for the Speaking of Crypto podcast. It's also episode number eight for our Women in Crypto Wednesday series. But before we get started, a big shout out and a huge thank you to our show sponsors. Thank you to Ledin, Stark, and Lolly for sponsoring the show. Thank you, Jane. Really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. You're in New York. I am. I'm attending a whole lot of events around the UN General Assembly. And there's some really exciting people here. But the conversation is all about social impact. So it's my kind of place. (laughs) Absolutely. Now, were you there? Did you see Greta Thunberg? Um, Did you see her speak? Because she was there this week as well. Yeah, look, the climate action has been really getting a lot of cover. Uh, I personally wasn't there because I've had a whole series of other events that I'm needing to be at. But, you know, we've all been watching the uh, broadcasts and we're all well aware of what's going on. So climate is really dominating the conversations. And then, of course, it's exciting because um, the Centre for Sustainable Finance and HSBC have released uh, a report on developing some green bonds. So that's big news for the blockchain community as well. Do you want to start with that then? I guess I would first ask, what are your impressions of Greta, this you know young activist, and what she's trying to do? Um, and then what do you think of these green bonds? Well, look, I think what she's managed to do, and this is important, is she's managed to galvanize people's attention um, to obviously what is an incredibly important issue to her, to her generation and to the planet. And, uh, you know, someone was making the point about the power of social media because, you know, one year ago, there was one girl sitting on the steps outside the parliament of Sweden. And then one year later, she's here with 3 million people at the UN. And that's really all about the power of digital. So, um, you know, I think that's the takeaway for me. People protesting and being activists is not new. Being able to use social media and harness the kind of passion of a, of a whole generation all around the world is something that can be done now that has never been possible before. So, as I said, it's powerful. It's kind of pervaded the conversations um, and... You know, I was really excited to meet Sophie Blackstad, who's one of the uh, people who authored this report on blockchain and green bonds. And it's looking at how blockchain can enable the green bond market to scale dramatically and, you know, potentially is going to change the way that people invest in climate finance, but also create incentives for people to invest in green investments rather than other kinds of investments. So, you know, there's real potential for transformation if this kind of thing kicks off. And and I was also speaking during the week to a, you know, a young, bright uh, blockchain finance person from Nigeria, and she was talking about how they can do green bonds, you know, locally to fund SMEs. So, You know, this whole thing potentially could really snowball. It's very exciting. And it's one of the perfect use cases for blockchain. And we've had the Bondi bond with the World Bank and the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. And while we don't know the detail of that, we are presuming it was very successful because they've done another one. And informally, people are saying they um, improved the uh, efficiency by 30% with that bond. But that's... That's rumor and speculation, but it sounds about right. 
Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, just a couple things. Sophie Black said, I haven't had a chance to meet her yet. Um, I was able to interview her co-author, um, Robert Allen, on the podcast uh, many months ago. Um, so um, it is exciting, the, the things that they're working on. Um, but so I thought maybe we could dive a little deeper into what a green bond is and sort of how it works and what the association with blockchain is. How does blockchain help with that? So what exactly no, is it? I think you, you need to interview Sophie Blackstead for that one. <laughs> I don't want to feel her thunder, and I'd probably be a liar if I said I really understood how green bonds work. <laughs> so I'd just like to handball that off to her and, and go on to some. That's a great idea. You know what? I absolutely will get her on the podcast and we'll have a conversation about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, no, Jane. Really, it's, but, it, but it is, um, you know, I've been writing a paper recently for the Commonwealth Secretariat about blockchain and sovereign bonds. And so this blockchain and bonds, whether they're green or whether they're sovereign debt, is a really serious use case that's getting a lot of attention. Uh, but, but, you know, I would prefer, uh, I'm kind of a helicopter view of the technology and where we're seeing it taking off, rather than someone who can give you a detailed explanation of, you know, exactly how it's working in a given use case, especially you know, one as complex as bond issues. So I'll just leave that for the experts. Yeah, it's a great idea. I will get in touch with her and, and hopefully have a chat about it. Um, so Jane, maybe I can ask you then, where would you say blockchain technology can be really helpful in the area or many areas of social impact? What are you seeing and what are you optimistic about? Look, I'm seeing a lot. And, and I think the key, the key always is solving the identity piece because particularly for the bottom end of the, of the economy and for emerging markets, you've still got 1.5 billion people who don't have identities. So if we're able to solve that problem and give them a safe, secure um, digital identity on the blockchain, then I think that's going to be the gateway to so many things. So there are many, many people who are working on that at the moment, loads of identity projects, they're all making good progress and you know, I think we're going to see uh, further use cases with greater scale coming up over the next year or so. The progress is really impressive. But once you have that, then, you know, I think the second place where it's going to go fastest, and it is already going fastest, is in the area of remittances and cash transfers, because blockchain is kind of the perfect adjunct to improving the flow of finances. So I think from the point of view of financial inclusion, reducing the flow, the cost of remittance flows, that's going to put a lot more money into the economy um, by essentially cutting out middlemen from those transactions. So I think that's, that's a, a really important one. Another one that's moving fast, which has relevance for social impact, um, is in the area of supply chains, um, both improving the efficiency of supply chains, but in, but giving us the ability to ensure the provenance um, of supply chains. So the example that's, you know, I think about a lot that's really relevant for social impact is around fake drugs, because this is a huge issue in a lot of countries. Um, and I was just hearing the other day about um, a project in Africa, which is using drugs to ensure the, you know, the quality and fidelity of medical supply chains. So I think that that is incredibly important because fake drugs kill people and don't save lives. And so if we can uh, really get that uh, transformed in the supply chains and get the supply chains using blockchain so that we can ensure where the medicines came from and that they've been safely transported, that'll make a big difference. Um, the third one that I think is really important and we're seeing more, but we still need to look at how to get kind of SMEs invested to do this is the microgrid tra uh, trading for green energy because with blockchains, it allows small producers with a single solar panel, for example, to sell small amounts of solar power and receive a micropayment for it. And at the village level in Africa and Asia and places like that, this is really going to make uh, an enormous difference because the key tool that people now have in 70% of the world is a mobile phone. But mobile phones need to be charged. 
And if you're living in a place that has no electricity, then the capacity for you to be able to go to your neighbour who's got a solar panel and charge your phone and then make a small micro payment uh, really gives you all of the access that mobile phones give people. So it's really important. Yeah. There's, there's loads and loads and loads of other <laughs> things. But, you know, they're the ones that, that I think we're going to see first. Yeah, those are all fantastic. Um, so maybe we can start with, can you give us a picture of um, what the world looks like from the view of someone who isn't, um, their identity isn't, let's say, official, or they don't have registered documents? Um, and what happens when you don't have that identity that you can prove sort of instantly? And why is this identity piece important? Well, it's, it's important because in most countries, if you don't have an identity, then you can't access a whole lot of services and things that you're entitled to. So if you think about it, in, in many countries, if you don't have an identity, you can't get a birth certificate, you can't get a marriage certificate, you can't get a passport, you can't get a bank account, you can't register land that might be owned by you. And, and then the other side of it is if you're a, a girl or a woman, you're more likely to be vulnerable to traffickers because you don't have an identity. So there's a whole lot of reasons why identity is just so, so important. And we often don't think about it because we just take it as an assumption that everyone has an identity um, or a driver's license or some way of proving that they exist. And so from an official point of view, these 1.5 billion people don't exist. And then if you think about refugees, which, you know, I see refugees and humanitarian as one of the most powerful use cases for blockchain, because these are usually people who have fled their homes and they often flee without their documents. And so they arrive in a new country, a camp. They don't have an identity. They can't prove who they are. They can't reconnect with their bank records. They can't reconnect uh, with their certificates if they've been qualified in some way. And it takes often years to be able to recreate all of these credentials that we take for granted that help these people resettle um, and recreate their lives in another place. And, you know, a blockchain digitally enabled identity, assuming that these other bank certificates and uh, degree certificates and other things have been safely stored somewhere, they can immediately reconnect with this and start rebuilding their lives much faster. So are you seeing this work in the area of identity on a blockchain being done by governments in countries around the world or are they through um, NGOs or different charities or what are you seeing? Where's the work being done and, and who is it helping? Well, it's being done and it's being done in a whole lot of different places. You know, I, I think ultimately it would be tremendously useful if the work that's currently being done by tech companies and by NGOs were recognised and adopted by government because uh, that will help people be able to access, you know, official government services and um, entitlements and so forth. But a lot of the work currently, I think governments are exploring it, there's no doubt. And I believe that uh, the government of Bermuda, for example, has come to an arrangement with a blockchain company to essentially um, use the digital identity for all of the populations of Bermuda. So you're seeing a lot of um, rapid adoption and innovation in small states. And there are some other countries in the world that are using blockchain for identity, but you're not seeing yet wide scale deployment, um, you know, across the world in big countries, but I think it'll come. So at the moment, a lot of it's the, you know, the tech companies developing the technology and then trying to promote it, but also places like the World Food Program, who are really some of the leading uh, innovators in the digital space are using it uh, with refugee camps in their humanitarian settings in Jordan and Kenya and Somalia, where they're using the combination of an identity um, and food vouchers, digital food vouchers to allow the refugees to be able to, you know, access food uh, in the camps. So there's a lot going on which shows 
how this can be used, how it can be used in um, low infrastructure settings. But I think there's still a way to go before government adoption will take place, um, you know, in big countries. But having said that, I mean, if you think about India, which has already got a, a digital identity program called Adhar, and that was actually hacked last year, and there are thousands, if not millions of Indian identities available for purchase on the dark web, it really brings into sharp fo focus the danger of not storing the identities securely on a blockchain, right. uh, which is a lot is a lot more secure than a standard database. So I, I predict this will happen, but I have just not yet seen it. Um, other than you know some of the small examples like Bermuda. Yeah. So how long could you see? Um, what would be your prediction um, in terms of let's say setting up most governments with an identity program um, so that any anybody from you know a refugee from some country can easily move from country to country and have access, like you're saying, to financial services and maybe credentials and things like that. How long do you think that might take? And do you think it will happen? Well, look, I it's. It's not for me a question of how long it'll take. It's a question of where it will happen. Mm. Because what I think is we're going to see, and we're already seeing the people who are moving fastest and embracing these technological innovations are in the emerging markets. Because in some cases, they don't have any kinds of systems, or if they have systems, they're pretty broken. And so I think we're going to see the greatest uptake of innovation um, in emerging markets. So it won't be in the US or Canada or Australia or UK. It's going to be in Nigeria, in Indonesia, in Bangladesh, um, and places where, you know, they can see the incredible transformational benefits of digital uh, tools. I mean, you only need to look at M-Pesa and how quickly that has scaled in Africa to understand that once people see that a technological innovation can actually solve a real problem that they've got, then they will embrace it. And, you know, back to Sophie Blackstad, they're working on a really interesting project digitizing women's cooperatives in Mali. Um, you know, people are solving real problems and bringing benefit to communities. And I think, and we're seeing those communities are embracing it. Yeah, I remember hearing something about, you know, back to remittances. Um, I think the Philippines is one of the countries with the highest remittance rate um, in the country, um, with most of its, I think it's the majority of its citizens are elsewhere outside of the Philippines. So remittances are really important. Um, and being able to put a remittance on a blockchain allows for those small amounts of um, transfer fees, as opposed to if you're sending a wire transfer through a bank, the fees are astronomical usually um, so I know that things are being done you know in countries where there's more of a need than like you're saying like in these emerging markets um, let me, let me um, also give a little bit of color to this because it's not just the the cost although that's mm. an important factor so when we were doing work um, with a proof of concept use case in Papua New Guinea uh, with a device that was designed to be able to uh, take a digital identity onto a blockchain and send and receive digital currency in a setting with only 2G and no electricity. Um, we, we went to a village in a very isolated part of Papua New Guinea, and this is what happens to the woman in the village who is expecting a remittance from her son in another country. Mm. She gets notified that there's a remittance for her she has to pay, I'll call it dollars, but it's the local currency, $60 of the local currency to take a bus or some sort of transport to the nearest town where there's a bank. That takes a day. She then on the next day has to go to the bank to get the money that's been sent. So let's say she got sent $200. She's paid 60. Let's say they take you know, $30 charges out of the $200 for the fees. And then she has to take another day to go back. So she's spent three days and $150 of the 200 that got sent. That's the reality for people who are living outside, you know, of the 
urban areas where the banking services are available. So this makes an enormous difference because in, in the alternate case, which is in the blockchain remittance case, she can receive it straight to her mobile phone or to a, a device, which was what we were experimenting with, with no charge and then immediately get access to that cash and exchange it for either fiat currency or store goods or something like that. That's a phenomenal change. That's incredible. Um, and can you tell us about any other examples of, you know, on the ground work that you've seen where, you know, blockchain is making a difference and, um, you know, really helping people who are in need? Well, it's look all over the place. I, I saw um, a presentation by a woman in uh, South Africa. She's got a project in Uganda called the Walla Project, and she's got 200,000 people, you know, exchanging and trading in digital currencies. In the Nigerian markets in Lagos, people are using it because their their currency is simply um, too difficult to be able to exchange. And, uh, you know, I think the other one that's interesting, and I was discussing this with Tessie Moraine from Consensus last night, is things like, you know, people who's, who live in a currency where there's a currency crisis and the value of everything that they've ever um, you know, accumulated is going down the drain, uh, buying Bitcoin because it's a safer store of value than the local currency. So if you think of Venezuela and Zimbabwe, there's a number of really interesting cases now where people uh, when their whole national currency is, you know, becoming worthless, are exchanging and essentially investing in crypto assets rather than anything else. So, you know, that's quite a big change and, you know, something that we need to think about and look at that's going on. Yeah, people in, you know, North America, Europe, Australia, like, you, you know, those in sort of westernized or, um, you know, these kind of countries really think that Bitcoin is so volatile that, you know, shouldn't we be wary of it? But when you live in a country like you're saying, like Venezuela or Zimbabwe or Argentina, where, you know, their own currency is being devalued, it makes so much more sense um, to invest in something like Bitcoin, even with its fluctuations. Um, did you want to talk about um, your book? You've got your book, Blockchain Technology for Global Social Change. Um, I thought I would ask you, Jane, I mean, what a great accomplishment. So congratulations on getting it out into the world. Um, but I thought I'd ask, who is your book speaking to? Who are you really writing for? And what do you want people to get out of all of this research and work that you've been doing? Well, look, thank you. The reason that I wrote it is because I think the world is oblivious to the incredible social change that's already going on with technology and that a way of sharing it, at least with some people, is to write it down. <laughs> so, so that <laughs> that's people, fantastic. People can access it. Um, I think the second piece, which is really important to me, is that most people just associate blockchain with the dark web and, you know, the crazy ICO era and the kind of crypto punks. And they think that it's something bad, shady and not to be really dealt with. And so what I really wanted to try and show was that there are a whole lot of ways that blockchain can be deployed that has the potential to create tremendous positive social change. Um, and one of the things that I don't see people doing much, and it's probably because there's not very many people who really understand it, is trying to talk to anyone who'll listen, frankly, about what the future might look like. Because many people are, you know, they're mired in the past. We're teaching kids in schools things that aren't going to give them the skills that they need to exist in a digital world. Um, and education's not keeping up, politicians aren't keeping up, and most people have no idea about the profound and fundamental social changes that are going on already in our society. So, so I wanted to try and share that. Um, you know, there's nothing uh, magic in the thinking, it's just trying to put on a page and put in a book the things that I've observed and learned over the last few years and what I think 
um, it's going to do. And from the social impact point of view, what I wanted to do and what I continue to want to do is to have people, instead of standing back and observing, actually leaning in and saying, yes, we can see this potential. We want to help shape it because we can see that these are transformations that are really important. And yes, there's challenges. There's no resiling from that. There are challenges in terms of scalability, challenges, challenges in terms of ethics, challenges in terms of you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum's power consumption, uh, challenges in terms of informed consent. We know those challenges are there, so they're the things you need to work on. So what I was hoping is to you know, inspire people to go, yes, actually this is something that could be incredibly important and I want to get involved, do something about it and harness it and help shape it so that it does have that really uh, transformative, pot positive potential, particularly in terms of social impact. So it was kind of all about that. And I deeply regretted starting it after I had because it was a lot of work. <laughs> you knew what a giant project it would be. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I, you know, really happy to have it, have it completed. But also, and I say that in the book, it's totally out of date now, you know, because the, <laughs> you everything's were... changing so quickly. But I was actually reflecting, you know, because I'm here in uh, New York and I've actually met and been speaking to a couple of the projects that we've showcased in that book. And I was actually reflecting that um, most, if not all of the projects that we showcased in the book are still going. So, it's great. you know, I think that that's, <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. No, it's yeah. wonderful. It's, um, it's extremely um, well researched and, but also illustrated. Um, you have a beautiful chart that connects um, different projects with the SDGs. So the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and which sustainable development goals they are reaching um, and what they're being done, what's how it's relevant to the blockchain. Um, and so I thought, do you want to talk about one of the projects that you have highlighted or featured? They're really intriguing. Um, and it is exciting work that you're, you're featuring there. Well, I, I'd like to I just mention one because I'm feeling so proud of them because this is a an Indian company called Somish and and what we profile in the book is their project called GovBlock. So they really set themselves out from the beginning to, you know, look at government, government services and interoperability and so forth. And I I actually met Ish Goyle, the founder of Somish. Um, in London in 2017 at a hackathon that we sponsored, which was around financial inclusion and government services in low income settings. And he was one of the winners with GovBlocks. And I've oh. kind of stayed in touch with him and encouraged him and, you know, tracked what he's been doing. We went together to Chattisgarh in India to look at what they were trying to do with their tribal population. And then he subsequently won... Um, a job with Chattisgarh to work on on some of the things that they're doing in blockchain to get the tribal population connected to government services. And he's just won a, you know, another piece of work, which is looking at interoperability between government services and databases in the event of a crisis call. So, you know, you call a crisis number and you need to be able to exchange data between health and police and ambulance and all of the other government agencies involved in getting someone to a hospital, for example, and he's working on that interoperability and data exchange between the different agencies involved, you know, in saving lives in, in the event of a catastrophe. So, you know, they're a great company. He's been working hard on this. It's hard for a lot of blockchain companies because it takes a long while before you get to any sort of revenue or anyone even takes takes you seriously. So I'm so pleased and proud for them that, that they've got this work and they're just chipping away and starting to show really valuable use cases where blockchain can be deployed to make um, government more effective and provide better services to their populations. 
Oh, it's fantastic. Um, it's a really optimistic success story, essentially, where, um, I mean, you, you see these hackathons or hear about hackathons where there's such great ideas. And the, especially with uh, the winners, what they come up with is fantastic, but often those don't go any further than, you know, potentially a weekend event or a week long event. Um, so nice to see that someone's built something that's actually, you know, still out there and, and moving forward. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. Jane, I thought I'd ask about your book again. Is there some, uh, a big learning or a big takeaway that you um, that's really hit you with having written your book. Um, I'm sure there's a lot well, of big, learning. I mean, other than don't think that you're going to write a book because it's really a terrible experience. But other than that, <laughs> Tell well, me it wasn't well, a terrible experience. <laughs> well, no, it's no, it's not a terrible experience. Now it's finished. But I can tell you when we were having to get um, drafts into the publisher because the publisher was pretty hardcore on meeting the deadlines that you'd agreed to. I wasn't feeling very uplifted at the time. Right. No, but you know what, what I think, that framework that's there, I would never have done that. But one of my co-authors, Sonia Bernhardt, who's a you know an early pioneer in women in technology and really an extraordinary person. And if you haven't interviewed her, I absolutely encourage you to do so. But we, we, we used to talk and talk about technology and I'd go, oh, I've been to India and I've been to Paris and this is what I'm seeing and it's so exciting. And she just said, wait, she said, next time when we're going to meet for lunch or coffee, I'm going to bring butcher's paper and I'm going to bring coloured pens and I just want you to talk to me because I can see how we can make a framework. Mm -hmm. And I, I sort of thought that was a bit strange and I said <laughs> okay because you know I'm not spatial at all and I would never draw a framework but having done that and having her use her kind of spatial systems thinking capabilities to take you know the download from my global thoughts and experiences about what I'm seeing in blockchain and then put it into something that people can kind of look at and see a framing about what's happening and what are the kinds of changes that uh, are, are likely to occur and then what kind of future we might see. Um, that's actually got a lot of really positive feedback and it's turned out to be quite a powerful depiction of, you know, the social change and the forces of change um, that are in, in the world. But I would never have done that without her. So, th so that my, I guess my lesson is, especially when thinking about really big, global things like blockchain technology and social change being able to somehow simplify this whole book and massive thoughts into a one-page framework uh, has proven very powerful absolutely um i think it also shows the power of you know two minds coming together to make a sort of greater good essentially um you know taking those two different ways of thinking around things um jane you put a post out there on linkedin a little bit um really just talking about taking action um so i thought i would ask you why the urgency what what do you want people to to start doing now well, I think, I think the urgency is the pace with which change can take place with technology. You know, we would never in our wildest dreams, and me certainly, have contemplated, you know, probably even five years ago, that we would just get in a stranger's car without a thought, that we would go and sleep in a stranger's house without a thought. You know, the, the speed with which things like Uber and Airbnb have just taken over like wildfire because of the technology and because they're actually kind of solving a problem that people had just makes me believe that if we can be as creative and have the ambition that the people who built Uber and, and Airbnb and I mean, even Facebook, you know, Facebook's got 2.3 billion users you know, it, it's connected with something like a third of the world's population. That's incredible. And these are then the way that these people have created these should also be able to be created um, to address social problems. And one of my kind of biggest, boldest dreams, I suppose, is this 
this notion that you can take the capability of blockchain to build these distributed autonomous communities um, which have a kind of internal incentivized system for people to participate in constructive ways if you could apply that i mean you know climate's the hot issue at the moment but if you could create a global distributed autonomous community incentivizing people to you know do the right kind of thing in relation to climate whether it's recycling or whether it's carbon emissions or whatever it is then you could deploy all of the features of blockchain to address the problems of the global commons and not just climate but that idea that there's this possibility there that if you had the technologists and if you had people who cared about climate and knew what the interventions were and you had a group of people who were thinking about how you would activate communities and governments and factories and you know uh, industry to all take these kinds of actions that are going to reduce emissions and you know improve the state of our planet that's really powerful and really um amazing so i'm hoping that you know in time people are people are trying to build small versions of that and i'm hoping that in time we can connect up globally and have a really big version of that and for us all we all live on the same planet and we can all collaborate together irrespective of what our governments think and do we can all collaborate together in this kind of global blockchain commons ecosystem to address the the problems of the planet i think that's incredibly exciting and i hope we can see it yeah um you mentioned facebook because of their you know enormous reach and you know what they might be capable of because of that what if facebook's libra coin and calibra wallet um, were instead used to do some kind of social good like what if they decided that instead of uh they ha instead of having them create this sort of payment system this payments network that maybe they were going to create um you know something to help with climate change or you know something like that do you think that those kinds of things a big giant um like a, a decentralized autonomous community like you're talking about hasn't happened or isn't happening yet or may not happen as quickly as something like a Facebook creating this payments network because of the incentive, because maybe there's just not as much money behind it like there is with the Libra Association now. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, the, what, what Facebook LibraCoin has done, which is, it's a bit of a diversion, but I think it, I think it was a really important kind of contribution is it's woken everyone up because I think until Facebook got out and said we're doing Libra coin governments and central banks they were kind of going oh well you know we'll think about this we'll look at it we'll study it for a while but it's sort of not real it's very far away and it's not an urgent threat to the global financial system mm. I think by Facebook doing that what it's done is made a lot of people really sit up and realize that this is immediate and that people don't have time to relax and think about it over a period of time. They've really got to pay attention and look at, you know, how you move into the future with all of the potential for not just Facebook, any of these big flat platform companies to do exactly the same thing. So, so I think the good thing that that's done is it's woken up all of the kind of legacy system, government, central bank people to take this seriously. So I think that's a contribution. And it's been very polarizing. I was just at OECD last week and the French Minister of Finance is, was stood up there and unequivocally said that LibreCoin was never coming to France. Um, in terms of social impact, you know, what we're seeing with a lot of the uh, really big successful crypto companies is they're starting foundations and they're started they they're sort of going well we've made a lot of money now we, we want to give back and we want to do something um, that issue about who would build something like a DAO I think it's got to be a confluence of mind so I think it would take I'm sure that that a number of uh, technology companies would build one if they got together with the right 
group of people who could sort of understand it and help them think how to shape it. Because I've, you know, had discussions with some of the more successful um, digital commerce companies over the last six months, just talking to them about what they're doing and what they could do. And oftentimes they say, oh, I'm so glad I've met you because we're technologists. We know we want to do something, but we don't know that world. And so we're not sure what to do. So, you know, we'd really appreciate more conversations with you about, you know, how we could deploy our technology. So I, I feel it's not, I think just the right combination of people haven't come together, hmm. um, you know, to form a group or a consortium or a collaboration um, of people who could actually achieve it. So I'm, I'm feeling optimistic that it will come because I know academic researchers that are writing papers on blockchain, solving the problems of the global commons. I know technologists who are building, you know, the basic kind of infrastructure that could solve global commons problems. You're now opening up. I mean, a big change with this UMGA over previous ones is there would have been a dozen blockchain events mm. with people talking about, you know, how blockchain can solve a whole range of problems and be deployed for the SDG. So there's an opening up of international institutions and governments about how this can help. So I think it's only a matter of time at what scale and, you know, whether it really can work at that level, we don't know yet, but mm. I think it's well worth trying. Yeah, it's it's really interesting to see, you know, what will happen. And I think, um, you know, you've got some some great ideas around it. I know the the Bill Gates Foundation is um, trying to tackle something like big giant problems like um, eradicating polio. And uh, I think another one is uh, work in sanitation. Um, and they're huge problems. And, it, and what you sort of understand is it's not just money. And it may not be one, you know, from one vantage point. But so I, I do love your idea of, you know, just this decentralized autonomous community or organization coming together from different aspects and angles, different countries, probably, in order to tackle these big problems. You've talked about, um, you have a term HC2 or hyper co-collaboration. Did you want to, did you want to explain where that came from? Oh, well, I, no, I'd read about the term hyper collaboration. Oh, um, it didn't come from you. No, no, no. I did the hyper co-collaboration. Oh, yes, that's right. So the, the hyper collaboration was already a term in existence. And I just felt that blockchain invites and demands collaboration at a scale beyond that which we've ever seen before. So I must have been feeling particularly inspired when I wrote that post. I, I felt that we could add a code to the hyper collaboration. <laughs> I like it. Try and, yeah, inspire something beyond that, the levels of collaboration we've ever known before. So yeah. that, that's really what it was. But I was, you know, at that particular time, just, you know, thinking about the collaborations that are possible with the uh, internet and the ability to be digitally connected, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, because if you even think about it, one of, one of the things that's been, you know, really quite surprising and interesting to me is this, this new concept of being an influencer. Because when I was younger and growing up and, you know, through most of my career, the people who could be really influential were largely, um, you know, prime ministers, heads of major corporation, heads of international um, agencies. And, you know, just a random person with a point of view at that time could never stand up, you know, on the stage at UNGA or anyone else and have opinions that people paid attention to. And that's totally changed um, with social media. And, and I think that's a, you know, particularly big lesson of my time. Even what's happened to me, which has been somewhat surprising to me, um, you know, that because obviously the things that I've been talking about have been resonating with people all around the world, that I now, you know, have a following of people who obviously have been thinking about the same things, but um, weren't connected with others who were thinking about it. So I just think this ability for us to connect to share ideas, to almost find our tribe, no matter where they are, and then, um, you know, be able to interact with them is, 
incredibly powerful and really interesting. Um, and it also means that you have the capacity, if you find enough people who share your ideas, to be able to express them with, with some power and influence in settings that you would have never got near before. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I had the pleasure of meeting you in person um, at the United Nations uh, several months ago in June. And we had a, a great conversation. And one of the things I was saying to you was I love that you are very colorful. And I love your your vibe. And I love your, um, your look. And you explained to me the one of the reasons behind it. Um, so I wanted to ask you about being a woman in crypto. And I thought, would you mind sharing what you had said to me? Do you remember what you said about? Uh... Yeah, no, I, I totally, I, I totally remember. But I, I want to say two pieces. So, I've always loved colourful clothes, and travelling around the world in India and Africa and Asia, you'd see these women wearing these most magnificent colourful outfits, and and I started collecting them. So I've you know, for quite a long time, had a collection of these amazing, colourful, somewhat outlandish outfits. <laughs> um, but at that time, I was sort of running a fairly conventional company and working with international donors and governments. And, you know, I felt that my job required me to dress in fairly conventional way. And then at some point, um, you know, I, I just got bold and said, well, <laughs> you know, I'm old enough now <laughs> and I don't really care. I really like these clothes and I'm going to start work, uh, wearing them. And maybe like but comfortable I, in your, your own skin as well, probably. You know? Yeah, totally. But the other thing, and this is what I said to you, but I, I, I share it with women because I think it's incredibly important, which is one of the things that happens as you get older, especially as a woman, is you become invisible. People don't see you. It's It's actually quite... Um, disconcerting in a way. People don't look at you, they walk past you, it's like you're not there. But what I find is because I'm so colourful and I have my glasses and my lipstick and my colour, that even if people didn't see me, they saw my clothes and they remember <laughs> me. So, I, you know, I think it's worth it. As you get older, like get colourful, get a style, because even if they're not looking at you, they remember you because of your style. So I love it. Yeah, too. it makes so much sense to me. And I love your style. Um, Thank you. And Jane, what would you say, what does it mean to be a woman in the blockchain space? Uh, that's an interesting question. So I, I'm never a person who's been uh, you know, a wilting shadow or anything like that. And I've never, never let being a woman stand in the way of anything that I've ever wanted to do or tried to do. But what I, what I realised being in this space, and, you know, that's a reason why I've um, really tried to step out and be very encouraging uh, to other women and talk about women in blockchain is that not everyone is blessed with that level of kind of self-assurance and courage and I think that, you know, we need to encourage women uh, to feel that technology and blockchain is a space that they can work, to not be intimidated by, you know, the kind of, it is male dominated and that there's lots of seemingly unfriendly people in strange dress up pirate costumes and then, you know, <laughs> really tiny Wall Street bankers. And I remember when I went to my first uh, blockchain conference in 2017 in London, I actually felt quite intimidated because it was this strange environment with largely men, combination of those two groups. And I felt like no one would want to speak to me, that it would be difficult for me to network. Um, and indeed, that's actually not what happened. I just had to overcome my own prejudices and have the courage to kind of step out into the crowd and talk to people. And I've never looked back, but I think we need to support women um, to find places where they're comfortable to interact, where they can learn, um, where they can be given the courage to believe that they can get involved in, in many different ways with technology. And I actually think technology is a great career for women, particularly if they want to be mothers, because it's so flexible. They can work from home, they can work any hour of the night or day, and actually it's a great career for women. But we need to kind of encourage women and we need to be role models, those of us who have managed to, you know, get out 
in either successful or leadership roles in this space and talk to other women about um, our lives and how we overcame different problems that we've had and just make them feel confident that they can do it too. So I really embrace that just showing women by what you've done and talking to them about it and giving them the courage to step out and do it too is a really important thing that leaders in the space should be doing. Absolutely. Have there been some difficult times or, um, you know, around the world, um, being a female, has it been challenging in different places for you? Well, look, yes, of course. And, you know, there's places where I've worked, and this is not related to technology, but just places where they don't have the same attitudes towards women as we do in the West and women are not afforded the same freedoms. Um, and even, you know, me as a woman, you know, in some countries w was not kind of welcomed in certain settings that exists, but I'm not one to judge that. I just, what I try and do is understand it and then think about I, how I can still achieve success with what I'm doing, even though, you know, I'm not able to, operate in the same way as I operate at home. You know, I think you have to take all your cultural prejudices off when you go to another country and you have to learn, you know, what life is like there and accept and respect it. And then think about where you can make an input because we, I mean, I don't think we have any place launching ourselves into other people's countries and, and being judgmental. If we want to have success and achieve things, you've got to work with where people are at and you've got to understand what the issues are and you've got to see how you can help. Yeah, absolutely. It makes sense. Um, now, however, the UN SDG number five is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Um, what would you suggest someone who is in a country where it might be more difficult for a woman or a girl? Where would they start, do you think? Well, you know, I, I think I used to have the four E's of gender equality. It's uh, education, electricity, economic opportunity, and elective pregnancy. They're the four things mm. that have changed our lives and allowed us to, um, you know, really be able to be independent and have careers. And so, you know, number one, I think, for girls and women everywhere is get educated because then you can get uh, a well-paying job and those two things together are going to change things significantly. So I think focusing on education and employment for women are the two most important things um, that we can support and enable. Fantastic. Um, is there anything else that we didn't get to that you would love to talk about? Did you want to talk about anything specifically that's happening in New York or any, anything else? No, I think I've talked a lot. I think, I think <laughs> it's been great. The listeners must have switched off about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> no. Um, but before you go, do you mind answering some fun questions? I've got five fun questions for you. Yes, yeah, sure. Great. Number one, if you could swap jobs with anyone for a day, whose job would you want to try out? I want to be Bill Gates. I want to sit on the top of a really big pile of money and be giving it away for projects and programs that are going to change the world. Mm, I wish that for you. I love Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> um, number two, if you could ask Satoshi one question, what would it be? Who are you? <laughs> so you don't know. No one knows. Mm. <laughs> I've, I've interviewed one person who said he knows who it is. I know that there are, I believe that there are people who know who have the utmost respect for who he, she, or they are, um, that they that they are choosing not to reveal the identity. Yeah, anyway, that's what I'd ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, number three, what's the most exciting, uh, what's the most exciting to you about cryptocurrency ecosystem right now? Um, being able to earn, save, give, or spend Bitcoin or crypto. Earn, save, give, or spend. So none of it is personal for me. It's but it's about the fact that I'm seeing in these emerging economies that people are using it to do all of those things. 
and improve their existence. And I think that's really powerful. And I think the more we see that, the more people are going to believe in it and we're going to see greater and greater rates of adoption. There's so many great use cases for cryptocurrency and you know, you're mentioning one that's fantastic. So it's exciting to see where this will go. Um, number four, if you could sum up your life so far into one moment, an event, a place or time in your life, is there something that you can, what would you say? Yeah, I thought about that one a bit. Um, it's not a particularly easy question to answer, but I, you know, I want to say when we did a gender equality SDG five hackathon in Lagos, Nigeria, it sort of brings together all of the things that, you know, I've been thinking about and working on, which is you're sitting in the midst of one of the most difficult developing countries in the world. You're working with all of these inspired young people who want to create a different future for Nigeria. And they're building tech solutions that, you know, conceivably could solve one of the greatest problems um, of our planet. And so, you know, just that moment of being part of that was really powerful. Mm, sounds beautiful. Um, and number five, do you any, do you follow any special diet? Meat no. only, keto, <laughs> vegan? <No>. Nope. <laughs> you enjoy it all. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. Jane, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me and lovely to talk to you again. Yeah. Good luck with the rest of what you've got going on there and then have a safe flight back. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Jane. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Speaking of Crypto with Shannon. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And for more great content and to stay up to date, visit speakingofcrypto.com and Facebook and Twitter at Speaking Crypto. We'll catch you next time.